Good afternoon, everybody. All right, we can do it. Charlene flew all the way from South Africa. Good afternoon, everybody. All right, now that's much better. Thank you very much for coming to welcome our dear friend and the person we admire very much, and we all of, um, all of us watch her on CNN, and now you get to see her in the flesh, and you get to listen to her. But I want to um, turn it over to Alex Jones, who's going to um, introduce Charlene. But I just wanted to say, just briefly, um, a word about the Macmillan Stewart lectures. Um, I was telling Charlene this story about an hour ago, and it has, as Henry Rosowski used to say, it's a good story, and it has the added advantage of being the truth. <laughs> One day I was sitting in my office, and Anthony Diopi and I had just come to Harvard, and um, Joanne, whom many of you know, my secretary, buzzed me and said, there's a woman here, and she says she wants to make a donation to the Du Bois Institute. And so I said, well, that's great, you know, just tell her to leave the check for $20, or, you know, or $50, or whatever, and, uh, you know, I'll get back to her, I'm busy. And she said, no, no, I think you should see her. So I went out and this woman, she had a French accent, and it turns out she was from France, and it turns out she had been married to a professor at MIT, and uh, she said that she had, I'd given a, a talk at a church on Bishop Allen Way, you know, over in Central Square, and she'd been in the audience. And she said that, you know, she hadn't particularly liked the point that I was trying to make, and I was thinking, God, I have to put up with this and listen to this for um, $20 or $50 or whatever, but um, she thought that um, my heart might be in the right place, and so she had a small donation, and that donation was $500,000. And I said, Joanne, get this woman some cappuccino. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> she said that, um, she, um, how come we weren't a Department of African Studies? And I said, well, since there's only uh, Anthony Appiah and me, <laughs> we haven't built African American Studies, maybe you'll give us a little time. But one day we will be building African Studies. And as you know, uh, pending the vote of the faculty next week, we will be changing the name of the department to the Department of African and African American Studies. And our newest professor is, um, happens to be seated in the front row. We just hired him, it hasn't even been announced yet, but I'm announcing it here. He's professor of Romance Language and, and African and African American Studies. The man, first African to get a PhD from the Sorbonne, and the man who had the first chair of um, Romance Languages on the African continent, Abiola Ireli. Abiola, stand up. But she said she loved Africa because she had had a, a best friend, and her best friend's name was Reba Stewart. And Reba Stewart had been a painter, and she had painted in Liberia and in Ghana, and she had died um, an untimely death. And she wanted to honor her and honor their friendship by creating a hyphenated lecture series called the Macmillan-Stewart Lectures. And uh, we inaugurated them a few years ago, and we have had, as Macmillan-Stewart Lectures, we have one a year, the lectures have to be, you know, dedicated to some aspect of um, uh, Africa broadly construed. And um, um, the first lecture was Wally Sharinka. Um, the second was Chinua Achebe. Uh, the third was um, great scholar Ali Mazuri. Last year, it was uh, Francis Abiola Irele. And this year, of course, it is Charlene hunter Galt. And here to introduce Charlene is um, Alex Jones, who's the director of the Jones Shorn Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy, and Alex is a lecturer in public policy here at the JFK School. Please welcome Alex Jones. Thank you, Skip. Not long ago, um, Charlene Hunter Galt wanted to go to Zimbabwe. Might not seem a terribly difficult thing for someone who lives in Johannesburg but Charlene is CNN's Johannesburg bureau chief, and Zimbabwe has banned CNN because of some reports viewed as unsympathetic to the government. Charlene's solution was to get accredited to cover the World Cup cricket tournament, <laughs> despite the fact that by her own admission, she does not know a googly from a wicket. <laughs> and after a brief stop at the cricket match, she went straight into the countryside to see and report on conditions there with the people she cared about, the Zimbabweans themselves. This is vintage Charlene Hunter-Galt, and a good demonstration of why those of us 
who were her avid fans when she was on the news hour are still mourning her absence each evening on PBS addressing issues, especially issues focused on America. But her removal to South Africa is the benefit to all of us from that perspective. It is meant that her measured, smart, and always brave voice is now focused on the issues and people of that continent, especially in South Africa. As many of you already know, Charlene has spent much of her life in the limelight, though she has not always been in the kind of limelight that is a happy one. She had the guts to undertake the burden of being the first African-American woman, African -American woman to be uh, admitted to and graduate from the University of Georgia in the early 1960s. She worked at the New Yorker and as a television reporter and anchor and then joined the staff of the New York Times. I'm proud to say that not only do we have tenure at the Times in common, we had, while we were there, the same rabbi. At the Times, you don't have mentors. You have rabbis. His name is Arthur Gelb. He's one of the paper's legends, and he is as proud of Charlene as though she were his own daughter. I know this because he's just written a memoir called City Room, which he will release as soon as just about to be published. He sent me the whole 800-page <laughs> manuscript to read as a favor. <laughs> Charlene is prominently featured. I am not. <laughs> oh, well. While she was at the time, she became the paper's first Harlem bureau chief and persuaded the paper to adopt the word black in favor of the word Negro. It seemed such a long time ago. Charlene left the Times to join the McNeil Lair Report, now the News Hour, where she did work that earned her a George Foster Peabody Award, as well as many, many other awards, including being named Journalist of the Year by the National Association of Black Journalists. Along the way, she published a memoir of her own called In My Place, which chronicled the early years of her eventful life. She left PBS after 20 years in 1997 for National Public Radio in South Africa. And four years ago, she joined CNN and has been reporting on Africa's glories and its pain ever since then. Tonight, she begins the three-part Macmillan Stewart Lecture Series to which she has given the overall title, New News Out of Africa. Her first lecture is called The South African Miracle, How Alive, How Well. Charlene hunter -Galt, welcome home. Thank you so much. Have to come to Harvard to get news about New York. Africans would say Sani Bonani, South Africans, Sani Bonani. And thank you so much for coming. I'm just delighted to be here, having been given an assignment by Professor Gates that has had me trembling for months. <laughs> so let's see what happens. Sometime during my early years, after I had learned to read I came across a poem that spoke to me directly. It was County Cullen's Heritage. It goes like this. What is Africa to me? Copper sun or scarlet sea? Jungle star or jungle track? Strong bronzed men or regal black? Women from whose loins I sprang when the birds of Eden sang. It wasn't until I had entered adulthood and entered the professional world that I finally set foot on the soil of the African continent. But from my earliest childhood memories, even before I dreamed of being a journalist, there was an Africa in my life. Even when it was only on the silver screen in depictions that today in retrospect make me sad. And yet, attributed perhaps to primal memory, somehow the stereotypes of hapless, if not demonic, Africans that occupied my Saturdays at what we then called the show. It was the dark and little segregated movie theater on the side street off of the town square in the small town of Covington, Georgia, that fed the mind of an only child. I was for 
nine years, an only child, whose salvation from that unique loneliness of being an only child was refuge in the imaginations of a mind made fertile out of both nurturing and necessity. A mind that thrived on mystery and intrigue, fed no doubt by the delicious mystery stories on the radio that were the weekly entertainment for those households, and there were very few, that had not yet been corrupted by the mind-numbing presence of, dare I say, television? <laughs> don't record that part. <laughs> or at least don't let my current employers get a hold of it if you do. But as a result, I was able to make leaps in my mind over the strong, muscular image of the heroic white Tarzan and his beloved life Jane swinging through the trees of the jungle, saving deserving African natives while savaging the rest. I cannot honestly remember any of the plots, only that the hero was always white and the villain was always black. Still, I indulged my time away from the jungle of the silver screen, happily creating my own African jungle in the enticing wooded area behind my house. I stunned my two adult children with my shrieks not long ago. They come to visit me in Africa every Christmas. We were on the eastern Cape Coast of South Africa, whereas Noah Mostert has described in his amazing book, Frontiers, blue-gray mountains fold across one another and tumble down to surf-strewn boulder or accompany long white be beaches. Nowhere else on earth, writes Mostert, do sea and sky and walled granite and shining sand convey any impression of nature more placidly reposeful more grandly and anciently benign. Calmly surfeited by its own overwhelmingly incremental fortune of light and color, ceaselessly spent all around on sea, sand, and forested slopes, it impresses me one as being a natural world, serenely dispassionate about itself, without connivance or hidden design. And so it impressed me as my children and I hiked along with my husband through the Tsitsikama forest, where the scent of its magnificent fame boasts in my nostrils and the appearance from time to time of some of the most magnificent birds and little tiny scampering animals, the bush so thick that it shut out the bright sunlight dancing on the water near the secluded pristine beach where we were headed. And I began to shriek, it's here, it's here. And my children initially froze in their tracks, thinking that I had encountered a puff adder or a black mamba. I just had to let them know that fantasies can come true, because I was walking through the real African bush, albeit not with Tarzan, but with a black African ranger who walked with the confident assurance of a man on recovered land that no one could ever take away from him again. It's my dream, I'm walking in my dream, I'm in a real jungle in Africa. So, what is Africa to me? Copper sun, or scarlet sea, the Tsitsikama forest, my jungle track. Yes, it's all that. And of course, more to me than even the poet who penned those lines could ever have experienced or imagined, because I don't think, did he skip? I don't think County Cullen ever got to the continent he wrote so lovingly about. So over the next three days, I do hope to try and answer the question, what is Africa to me? To put myself into a context as I explore the evolution of a South Africa in transformation, a far cry from the South Africa that assaulted my emotions and challenged my professional distance on my first trip in the tumultuous land in the last decade of apartheid, to explore over the next few days the continent as it too struggles to find its place among the global family of nations, this slow dance towards democracy, the most dramatic development, I think, since the end of colonialism. And finally, to look at how South Africa and Africa are portrayed to the world, both by those of us known as the, quote, foreign media and those who claim it as their own. 
I'm so sorry that Ted Turner has left CNN because he banned use of the term foreign during his entire tenure there, but he's gone and it's back. <laughs> I wish to declare up front that I am confronted by a peculiar challenge. Seeing the continent and the people who <laughs> inhabit it through a prism forged in the anvil of growing up black and female in the United States, through America's own transition, if not transformation, from a country that still embraced a part of itself that denied people of color the same place in its world as whites and that failed to yield without a fight. I am the product of the triumph of a battle waged with the armor of moral authority. When Hamilton Holmes and I joined young people all over the South in a crusade to force America to practice what her constitution preached, we were armed only with our dreams to be free and the moral force of nonviolence. With that, we boldly confronted evil, jeering mobs of brick throwers and spitters, police dogs and water cannon, and men who murdered some of us. That's how it went. The civil rights revolution that changed us all from Covington to Cape Town, liberated. I wrote about this in my book, in my place, and I knew I was coming to Harvard and would be all right to quote myself. <laughs> That's what professors do, isn't it? Because this was my favorite passage in my own book, because it's so true that as we launched into the civil rights movement in the early 60s, we could see in a new light both our past and our future. We could see that past, the slavery, the segregation, the deprivation, and the denial for what it was. It was a system designed to keep us in our place and to convince us that it was our fault as well as our destiny. But then, without either ambivalence or shame, we began to see ourselves as the heirs to a legacy of struggle. But struggle that Martin Luther King was teaching us that was ennobling. Struggle that was enabling us to take control of our destiny. And as a result, we didn't see ourselves or the other young people demonstrating throughout the South as heroes to be praised or celebrated or fretted over. We were simply doing what we were born and raised to do. And while not everybody in the adult black community was on board, the Atlanta student movement, of which I was a part, had spoken in terms that became the watchwords for all of us. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. At the same time, Africans were taking control of their destinies, throwing off the yoke of colonialism. And while all were not nonviolent, Many embrace the notion of the just war. With our twin moral struggles for justice, for dignity, and freedom, it was then that Africa began to be for me more than copper sun or scarlet sea, jungle star, or jungle track. <clears throat> it was the brother of then President John F. Kennedy who articulated the connection at a critical time in my own history, mine, America's, and Africa's. Then Attorney General Robert Kennedy came to speak at the University of Georgia just after Hamilton Holmes and I had walked through this wall of white resistance and become the first two black students to enroll there. And while we had broken down the legal barrier of the color bar, the white racist mentality was still alive and well, still refusing to accept black humanity as fully human. Even young minds had been corrupted, and as they talked about, well, it was actually Bud Trillin, who uh, works for the New Yorker magazine, had come down to do uh, an article for Time magazine on the, on the desegregation and how it was going. And one of he, he got such pleasure out of the mixed metaphor of a young student describing the 1954 Supreme Court decision outlawing segregation and the law that served as the basis for our entry as the long arm of judicial tyranny is crushing us 
under the heel of its boot. <laughs> so this was the mindset on that particular day when Robert Kennedy came, at least among the whites, many of the whites, most of the whites, not all. It was the era of the Cold War, where the United States and the Soviet Union were in a hot contest for global supremacy, communism versus, versus democracy, with Africa as the major battleground. The Kennedys needed Africa, not least because, as African scholar Sally Booker put it, with decolonization in Africa, apartheid in America became an untenable liability for Washington in its battle with Moscow for global influence. It was an era of intensified struggle and of high hopes, both for Africans and their lost relations in the United States. As I sat lost in thought in a sea of mostly hostile white faces, Robert Kennedy began to speak to a crowd as hostile to him as to me. And this is how I remembered it. Kennedy talked about the challenge of international communism, the defining context of the Cold War era in which we were living, and about organized crime. And then he entered the real danger zone, civil rights, which Southerners unabashedly viewed as a communist conspiracy, as they said. He, he started out by saying Southerners have a respect for candor and plain talk. They certainly don't like hypocrisy. And then he proceeded to lay a little candor on them. <laughs> he pointed out that 50% of the countries in the United States, in the United Nations, are not white that around the world in Africa, South America, and Asia, people whose skins are a different color from ours are on the move to gain their measure of freedom and liberty. This is 1961 now. And he continued, from the Congo to Cuba, from South Vietnam to Algiers, in India, Brazil, and Iran, men, women, and children are straightening their backs and listening to the evil promises of communist tyranny and the honorable promises of Anglo-American liberty. And those people will decide not only their future, but how the cause of freedom fares in the world. Now, I was sitting there thinking at this moment, this is a hell of a speech. And I was wondering how much the Attorney General had actually been told about what had been going on at the university, the riots that greeted Hamilton and me, and, and in fact, how much he knew about the quote unquote situation as it existed at the moment if indeed he even knew our names. I vaguely heard the next words. In the worldwide struggle, Kennedy said, the graduation at this university, and then I heard the words that almost knocked me off my seat. He said, the graduation from this university of Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes without, will without question aid and assist the fight against communism, political infiltration, <laughs> and guerrilla warfare. <laughs> I have to say, I was in a mild state of shock after that. Did I hear him right? Did he really say that our graduation was going to assist in the defeat of communism, guerrilla warfare, and what was that other thing? <laughs> At the end of the day, Hamilton Holmes and I, along with thousands of American black children and adults, had our victory over racism and bigotry when we graduated in May 1963, when separate but equal disappeared from the lexicon of American discourse. And while America made or was forced to make the right choices in that battle, American policymakers went on to make a series of wrong choices in the newly liberated nations of Africa, backing despots like Congo's Mobutu, Mobutu Sese Seko, who abused their people, denying them the promise held out by independence. The imperatives of the Cold War led both Republicans and Democrats alike to make choices inimical to Africa's progress as it buttressed regimes it deemed necessary to protect against an arc of crisis from Asia to South Africa, resulting from Soviet expansionism, about which we'll talk tomorrow. Thus, Nelson Mandela and his African National Congress, who were among those believed that they were fighting a just war, 
were seen as terrorists rather than as liberators. And the United States aligned itself with the apartheid regime in South Africa and movements the regime supported like Jonas Savimbi and UNITA fighting a 30-year war in Angola that only culminated last year with Savimbi's death and the death of millions and millions of Angolans, most of whom were innocent civilians not engaged in combat not to mention the maiming of so many who walk around there now with one arm or one leg or whatever. Thus the context of America's relations with Africa and with African Americans like myself. Being a journalist and an African American in Africa poses some of the same challenges as being an African American working in America, where the phenomenon so eloquently described by W.E.B. Du Bois is alive and well in those who survived him. As Du Bois expressed it, one ever feels his twoness, an American and a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder, and no wonder. When I was being interviewed, for example, by a New York Times editor who shall remain nameless prior to being hired in the late 1960s, he asked me if he thought, if I thought I could tell the truth when covering the people in Harlem. So even if one tried to be a colorless professional, it would be a bit like those who insist they are colorblind in total defiance of logic and reality. Of course, Du Bois' explication was written to apply to a different context, and yet I often find myself thinking about it as I am challenged to reconcile my observations of an Africa to which I am spiritually, culturally, and historically connected. Skip showed me where I came from today. And also as a professional, ostensibly detached, where the perception of me is, not only, is often not only as a foreigner, but as an American, and that's a different kind of foreigner, now more than ever in these post-Iraq days. And sometimes the perception is even that I am white. My husband read this and he said, you gotta explain that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's more than once. I have been, I've had to gently explain that though my skin may be light, no, I am not white as I was in Kano, Nigeria, and the young fixer who was helping me find my way from place to place finally summoned up the courage to ask if he could ask me a personal question. When I responded affirmatively, this was his question. Do other white people like you braid your hair? <laughs> <laughs> the concept of an African American is still one that some Africans find hard to understand. But by the time I finished with my young fixer, I think he understood. Now the Nigerian singer Sade looks to me to be about my complexion. And I've met other Nigerians with the same color shading as mine. But I think what tips the balance for those like my young fixer is my American accent. At any rate, this is the hair and the hat I was wearing as I prepared to live and work in Africa for the first extended period of time in my life. The hat and the hair I was wearing at the end of a month-long French intensive course in the south of France when my classmates and I were required to write a final paper and present it orally in French, of course. It was August 1997 and I was about to take up my assignment as Chief Africa Correspondent for National Public Radio based in Johannesburg. It was a heady moment for me and for South Africa only three years into its first truly non-racial democracy. A time when South Africans and the rest of the world were still marveling not only at the speed at which the deeply entrenched system of racial oppression known as apartheid had ended, but also at the mostly peaceful manner of the transition that white South Africa had given up without a fight, that there had been no widespread civil conflict between blacks and whites was truly a miracle. Hence my title, which I labored over for days, Le Miracle de l'Afrique du Sud. Fast forward to six years later, Dateline, Johannesburg. Whenever anyone is looking for me on the weekends, 
and managed to reach my husband, an investment banker with J.P. Morgan, who's mostly very serious, but who also spends a lot of time on the golf course. So he doesn't too much like it when his mobile phone rings and somebody's found him looking for me. So he swiftly dispatches the caller with these words. She's probably in Rosebank checking on her property. And he's mostly right. I am in Rosebank, an upmarket shopping center in one of Johannesburg's northern suburbs where I have spent more than a few South African rands and maybe enough to own a share in one of the trendy little boutiques now proudly displaying ethnocentric wares of up and coming black African designers. But I don't own any property there. I'm not in Rosebank to check on my property, but to track the Miroc de l'Afrique du Sud. For Rosebank was my first point of entry into a very different Johannesburg than the one where I am now whiling away weekend hours, if not shopping, meeting friends for dinner or lunch or drinks or and they're, they're, they're friends who are young and old and black and white and brown and all of the colors of, of the rainbow. And they are totally unselfconscious about being in this place at this time. But no matter how much fun I'm having in Rosebank, I cannot dismiss from the chamber of my consciousness that holds the memory, the Rosebank of 1985. And for that, I have to take you back for a few minutes to 1985. I had just arrived in South Africa with a team of four, African, four Americans joining three South Africans and a British producer. We have come as the world's image of South Africa is being formed by what viewers see on their television screens. Relentless violence by state security forces against mostly defenseless black men, women, and children who have but a single simple wish to be treated as human beings the equal of other human beings. And for that, they are being subjected to some of the world's worst violence. We have come to South Africa to try and penetrate what has now become the cliche of apartheid, a near indecipherable mass of brutalizers and the brutalized, of victimizer and victim, of evil versus good. Because you turn on your television set and there's a bunch of white policemen or even some black ones beating uh, black people, but except for Mandela, none of them had a name, especially outside of South Africa. And by the time we arrived, we too are the enemy. The regime has declared a state of emergency, giving it broad powers to restrict any and all movement, especially in and around the sprawling black townships near indescribable black enclaves with little electricity or running water where the playgrounds of children are often the slimy, fetid streams of garbage and waste that bear no attempts at disguise. These locations, as they were also called, miles outside of the white cities, engineered by the apartheid state for easy containment in case of trouble, like now, then, 1985. The state security agents knew not only that we were there, but where enter for the first time Rosebank. We were staying in a small low-rise uh, hotel chosen for its ease of access for our television gear. Most journalists stayed at the more popular Carlton downtown, but it was a high-rise. This place was a lot more user-friendly for television crews. So the Rosebank Hotel became our home for the next month. And while there were few journalists with us, not so subtle state security forces were ever present and ever watchful. On one of our first forbidden forays into one of the townships, we were confronted with an ugly reality sooner than I was emotionally prepared for. Sister Agatha, a sympathetic nun, had taken us to see for ourselves the kind of senseless, unprovoked violence the state was unleashing day in and day out on the people of the township. We walked to a house where we were greeted by a tall, heavy-set woman who walked with a lumbering gait and who had difficulty lowering herself down into the chair in her tiny living room where we had gone to hear her story. Assured by Sister Agatha that it was all right for her to talk freely, she began to tell the story of how black police agents had come to her place of business 
an unlicensed bar known as the Shabine, the kind that were prevalent all over the townships because it was the only place black people could go to socialize. And after having a few drinks, these, these, these policemen began taunting and eventually beating her, finally taking her to the police station. She said that they never told her why, although there was a suspicion that they may have thought she was connected somehow to the underground activities of the anti-apartheid movement. But surely, they, and, and they slowly but surely were making the country ungovernable. But she insisted to us that she was not. As she told us her stories, she showed us her scars. Her huge breasts were green from the bruises sustained during the beating. Likewise, her head was blood caked with the scarred residue of so many blows. Her back bore the scars of the shambok, the long black rubber whip favored by the police in their confrontations with activists. Even growing up in the American South of lynchings and other brutalities of segregation, I had never seen anything like this. Halfway through her story, I excused myself, planning to go outside and get a hold of my emotions. But I only made it as far as the kitchen, where I collapsed on the floor, unable to contain my pain, manifesting itself in a rush of my own tears. I finally collected myself enough to go back in and record the story. We left promising to return the following day to shoot scenes in and around the Shabine. But on the way out, we were caught by no-nonsense Afrikaner police agents and given a stern warning to leave and not come back without a permit which, of course, was impossible to obtain. It was part of the state's disingenuous dance, like pretending to be democratic while denying the black majority most of its civil and human rights. No, it was pretending that there was, in fact, a process <laughs> for getting permission to report, sort of like Zimbabwe is doing these days, to get permission to report on the townships when, in fact, there was a process only it was designed to do just the opposite. They call it the stall. Nowadays, they say send the facts. It means the same thing. <laughs> Fortunately, they didn't take our tape. Back in Johannesburg, our eagerness to proceed blinded us to a certain reality. We had given the tape for transcribing to a white company. The following day, a stocky white man came knocking on our door. I was asleep in one part of the suite, my white South African colleague, Cliff Bestel, working in the adjoining room where we had set up an edited suite, editing suite. Awakened by the knocking, I lay there listening to the unfolding conversation. The white man was saying his machines had broken down and he wouldn't be able to transcribe the tape. Ever? My colleague asked. Never came his reply. <laughs> By this time, I had thrown on my robe and cracked open the door. I could see the big man, behind whom was standing a young man wearing white socks. Now we all know what that means. He never spoke. When the door finally closed, my South African colleague spoke to me in sign language, indicating that I should dress rapidly, grab my big pocketbook, and put the tapes in it and get the hell out of there on a double. Even if we couldn't get back into the township, we had just barely enough to tell the story of this amazing situation. But without those tapes, we had no story, and we had no time to find another, particularly if the police prevented us from returning to the township, a very real possibility. Emerging into Third Street, we drove around Rosebank. It's nature, stunningly hospitable. It Beautiful tree-lined streets awash with all manner of pink bougainvillea and orange and purple uh, birds of paradise. Spacious homes, those that we could see because most were hidden behind high brick walls designed to keep out the black hordes. They called them the Svartgevar. These were the ones who were clamoring for liberation in their minds the real family jewels, but the walls were set up to keep them out, except for their blacks, 
the faithful domestics and garden boys, some of whom were almost 80 years old, many of whom lived on the premises in tiny cramped cubicles outside the main house, others who made the daily trek from the locations in the overloaded minivans they called taxis. Years later, they were dubbed mobile coffins by none other than the country's second black president, Thabo Mbeki, because of the incredibly high death rate due to ill-trained and often unlicensed drivers, poor maintenance of the vehicles, and greed that leads and led to near suffocating overloading. But the, but the passengers discharged from the mobile coffins or climbing into the mobile coffins, but for them, Rosebank bore no sign of South Africa's teeming masses yearning to breathe free, standing in, in all its splendor in stark contrast to the townships in all their squalor. Within an hour, Cliff had decided to take the tapes to the BBC on the assumption that the state security agents would not be going there so soon after the raid on their premises the previous week. So we headed for the modest house where they worked, found their bookcase, and placed our precious package behind a row of books scattered along one of its dustiest shelves. By week's end, we had managed to sneak back into Quatema, that was the name of the location, and complete the story, dodging the state security agents all the while. My journey into the apartheid state took me back to my days at the show. Only now I was a character in some grade B science fiction movie, stepping back in time to when my adventurous family would start on on a trip from Covington, maybe to visit our country cousins and social circle, or to go to a shop in the big city of Atlanta some 30 miles away. And among the items we'd pack in the car were brown paper bags in case we needed to relieve ourselves, for there were no toilets that black people could use along the way. A long since thing of the past, in the America of the 80s from which I had just come. But when I flew with Cyril Ramaphosa, the head of the National Union of Mines, who may one day be president of South Africa, on a union organizing trip to the Kimberley mining town in the center of the country. In 1985, we landed and spent the first few minutes on the ground trying to figure out where we could go to use the toilet because the one directly in front of us was for whites only. I was to learn that this was God's will. The architects of apartheid had found a justification for white supremacy in the Bible, as had many a Southern segregationist in America, if you'll recall. And the majority of South Africa's white minority praised God and celebrated their white selves with impunity that was both man-made and divine. I may have stepped out of the time capsule I journeyed through apartheid South Africa in, but the experience didn't step out of me. Back home, America saw our series as the first up-close look at South Africa's victims, the oppressors, as well as the oppressed. When I came back to live in South Africa 12 years later, I found a country making history, as monumental and as challenging as the civil rights revolution in America. And while there had been violence as there had been in the American South, at the end of the day, when the oppressors changed places with their oppressors, the transition itself was mostly peaceful. The process as unique as finding a country still colonized in the latter half of the 20th century. South Africans had ended their de decades-long obscenity of minority rule, not on the battlefield, but at the negotiating table. And as fractious and often bitter as that process had been, within a small space of historical time, South Africa had become, in the words of Alistair Sparks, one of its chroniclers, another country. Democratic, non-racial, where its first black president, Nelson Mandela, voted for the first time in his life in 1994 at age 75. 
Indeed, he and his compatriots had earned this right through their blood, sacrifice, and tears. Tears that I had first shed in Quatema, then again, when I returned this time around to cover the process that made it possible to avoid civil war. It was called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and was established to give whites in the main an opportunity to tell the truth about the gross violations of human rights in exchange for amnesty. As I wrote in the introduction to Country of My Skull, a white South African writer's chronicle of her personal and professional journey through the process, which is now being made into a major motion picture starring Sam Jackson. <laughs> They're down there making it now. Controversy dogged the TRC from the start. There were those who believed that the perpetrators of gross human rights violations should appear before a court of law, as Nazi war criminals were first forced to do at Nuremberg. That, they insisted, was the only possible path to justice. But there were those who pointed out that it was not a battlefield victory that had produced the end of apartheid, but a settlement negotiated by victims and perpetrators alike. Amnesty, they argued, had been a necessary precondition for securing the cooperation of the previous government and especially its security forces. The deal was to hold out the promise of amnesty in exchange for the full truth about the past. That, of course, didn't happen. Few of the top leaders came forward. Most who did didn't live up to their end of the bargain. Most lied. And the debate continues today of the original terms of the contract, of the legacy it has left. As recently as last month, when the final codicil to the report of the Truth Commission was handed over to President Becky with recommendations that the government pay a total of uh, a, 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 a large sum to certified victims and businesses that did business during, during apartheid help pay. The government rejected any wealth tax on business and came down firmly against the kind of lawsuits being pursued now against companies that did business as usual during apartheid. In fact, President Becky declared that South Africa would not honor judgments handed down in foreign courts against such companies. That has sparked as much debate as the payment the government announced it was making to the TRC certified victims, a one-time payment of something on the equivalent of about $3,900. Some victims happily accepted the offer, but many, like Onika Dutrilong, said it wasn't fair. That apartheid killed her 25-year-old son, shot him in the head, depriving her of her breadwinner. Now 60 years old and suffering from high blood pressure and heart problems, she can't work. She has no way to earn money. Likewise, Tandi Shazi says she suffers from migraines, from the electric shock torture her apartheid tormentors used on her, followed by nearly suffocating her with a plastic bag they placed over her head. This just before four of the white policemen who were her torturers took her into a room and each one of them raped her. She was then placed in solitary confinement for a year. And, and she was treated this way only because she was the girlfriend of someone they thought belonged to the underground wing of the ANC. She said, we are not suing them to get money and be rich. But we are saying they need to come back and acknowledge the wrongs they have done in our country and come back and try to redress the problem. Some see the government's antagonism to the lawsuits as part of a delicate balancing act, if not a concession it believes it must make to keep business doing business and attracting more business in order to grow an economy that will help it fulfill its promises of a better life for all. The black majority have been liberated from political oppression. They have yet to be liberated from the constraints of an economy still dominated by whites. Still, one of the things that makes being in South Africa at this moment in its history so exciting is to be able to witness how differently a country with a black majority reacts to issues of race and redress. Affirmative action may go by another name, not diversity. It goes by transformation. And transformation is about what, the, what it is about and what the government make, makes no apologies for 
is black economic empowerment, aimed at empowering those who have been denied and disadvantaged on the basis of color. As a result, a black economic elite is developing, though as yet not enough of a critical mass, to have their power working not only on their behalf, but on behalf of the masses of the poor. A recent study, for example, showed that private sector managers remain overwhelmingly pale and male, as one newspaper recently put it, with whites continuing to dominate the plum positions. In a study of some almost 2,000 firms, blacks occupied only 25% of top management positions, with women holding only 12%. A major challenge for this government is how to deal with the questions of enrichment of a few while creating a broadly based black middle class without destabilizing the democratic capitalism of the new South Africa. I'd like to see a Harvard mathematician construct an equation for that one. <laughs> Case in point, the government recently arrived at a new mining charter calling for 26% black ownership within the next 10 years, described by the country's Minister of Minerals and Energy, Pumzi Lingluka, as probably one of the brightest days in the history of our transformation. But a draft version of the charter leaked to the media earlier and calling for 51% black ownership created an uproar causing fears of nationalization and sending the mining houses into a tizzy, especially those listed on international stock exchanges, and we know why. Stocks plunged and negative perceptions of the country soared. Intense negotiations between the government, the mining houses, and the union, and other stakeholders resulted in a final document that everyone could live with, another negotiated settlement, but a race against time. For even as the space is created for blacks to step into the economic mainstream, few young black South Africans are ready to jump in and swim. South African economist Sampi Terreblanche made this observation recently. Since 1994, the year of the first non-racial election, unemployment has increased with 2.5 million young people have, having entered the labor market and having been unable to obtain permanent jobs. Crime and violence, which became, became endemic in the apartheid era, are being perpetuated in the post-apartheid period, causing havoc among the poorest half of the poorest half of the population. The poorest 50% are most completely marginalized from the mainstream of the economy. Thus, almost 10 years into its new democracy, South Africa reminds me in some respects of the point where America was in 1968, when a presidential commission reached the conclusion that took most Americans by surprise, to wit, America was in fact two societies, one white, rich, and prospering, one black, largely poor, and in decline. The explosion that this condition led to in America of the late 60s has yet to happen in South Africa. But there are worries that legions of unemployed youth with little education and virtually no skills will not remain as patient as their elders, who also from time to time express frustration, but remain loyal so far to the ruling party. No other opposition party comes close at this point to being a serious threat, let alone being paid attention to. Efforts are being made to bring more young blacks into higher education and to be supportive of them once they are there. This includes companies with scholarships or bursaries as they are called there and guaranteeing hiring at the end point. There's also an especially innovative program, the country's first free university, a kind of city college where students help maintain the place and grow some of their own food. Moreover, a few schools in the townships that don't even have books on the shelves, let alone science labs or computers that work, are nevertheless managing to produce high achievers by sheer determination, commitment, and will. Some of those kids get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and walk for miles to school to find teachers there waiting for them. And the teachers come back in the evening and they come on the weekends and they're not paid for that. I recently visited one of those schools as Africa's first astronaut Mark Shuttleworth was about to be launched into space. 
at the last minute, and I actually think it was when CNN called and said that we were, would like to come, a television set was rigged up at the front of the tiny room that was the library, and some 50 students crammed in to watch this historic moment. Few others around the country were so lucky. And yet, here and elsewhere, students nurture dreams of following in the footsteps of the first Afronaut, even when their course of scientific study is limited to reading about and not being able to even do practical experiments because there are no labs. And that is truly a major part of Le Mirac de l'Afrique du Sud, that for all the perils that lie ahead and for all the obstacles at present, young people in South Africa do now have the space to dream. To be sure, it's early days, a fact about which those of us who make judgments and take measurements need to be constantly reminded. At the same time, the peril of AIDS is causing many dreams to be deferred. U.S. Ambassador Cameron Hume recently told the American Chamber of Commerce that from 2002 to 2010, life expectancy in South Africa due to the influence of AIDS is expected to drop from 48.8% years to 36.5 years, a 25% decrease. In addition, South Africa is one of five sub-Saharan African countries that will actually experience negative population growth by 2010. It will be only one of four countries in the region that will have more infant deaths from AIDS by 2010 than from all other causes combined. HIV-related deaths are also expected to burden South Africa with many thousands of orphans, overcrowded hospitals, and serious social and economic disruptions unless something is done to change the course of the epidemic. This has given rise to a new post-apartheid generation of activists who are turning out to be among the most effective to emerge from a civil society decimated at the end of apartheid when many funders, like many media executives, concluded that the story in South Africa was over. The AIDS activists in South Africa are managing to have their voices heard in the streets and in the courts, already have enforced what they see as a reluctant, if not denialist, government to agree to provide antiretroviral drugs to HIV positive women in public hospitals. Their current campaign is to force the government and the pharmaceuticals to make those drugs available and affordable to the masses, who according to them are experiencing some 600 deaths per day, including many of their own leadership. Much confusion reigns over the government's position and much blame continues to be laid at the president's feet. He has stepped back from the debate, but the government has yet to commit itself to a comprehensive AIDS program that includes making widely available antiretroviral treatment to AIDS victims. The government has made some 300 million rands or a little less than $3 million in its 2003 AIDS budget but inexplicably failed recently to get the necessary paperwork done to receive some $41 million from the Global Fund to fight AIDS. The man was able to check in his pocket. The dinners had been had, the receptions had been conducted, and he left without being able to hand him the check. AIDS activists who had voted to escalate their campaign for antiretrovirals have recently put their campaign on hold in good faith, allowing the government space until May 17th to respond to their demands. I don't know if you read the story, uh, the story of Zaki Ahmad in Time Magazine and the New York Times recently. Um, he was one of Time Magazine's, uh, how many was it, 36, 35 <coughs> heroes uh, recently featured. And the New York Times did a much longer story, but he is almost dead from AIDS. And he can afford to buy antiretrovirals but he has vowed not to take them until those who cannot afford them are able to have access to them. He's leading that campaign. 18 years ago, on September 5th, 1985, before I had invested in Rosebank, one of our reporting team on apartheid's people was a young South African by the name of George Dayoff. It was spelled D-E apostrophe A-T-H. 
uh, and if you remove the uh, whatever that thing is, it's spelled death. Thus, his nickname, Dr. Death, apostrophe. He had been an enormous help to me in decoding the details of apartheid in 1985. And on those nights when we were unwinding after tension-filled days of ducking and dodging apartheid agents, George would agonize about his future. He loved his country, but he hated apartheid. And as we were leaving, after having done our series, he was staying, he gave me a book. It was called The Africans by David Lamb. George wrote a little note before the preface calling my attention to the last three lines of the introduction, saying he hoped they would come to be the first lines for a better future for us Africans. The lines were as follows. But troubled as these early years of nationhood have been, Africa need not dwell forever in the uncertain twilight zone. Its dreams have only been mislaid, not lost. Not long after that, George traveled to New York where he visited with me and my husband and two children. Later, he and I had a great romp down Broadway when I took him to buy something other than his signature blue jeans and t-shirt to attend a going away party for one of his many girlfriends. <laughs> That's the story of the cameraman, but we won't go there. At some point, he said he longed for the day when, when, when he and I could do that in Johannesburg, a black woman and a white man as unnoticed by the other passers-by as we were that day in Manhattan. A year later, in 1986, back in still tumultuous apartheid South Africa, George was attacked with machetes when caught in the crossfire between rival political groups in a black township. Within a few hours, Dr. Death was dead. As I check my property today in Rosebank, I often think of George. And I wonder what he would think about his country's dreams today. Certainly no longer lost, though a white man not long ago walked up to a bus crowded with black people and shot into it, killing several. A white judge just sentenced him to two life terms. There are, however, other cases with less good outcomes and a cry from none other than Nelson Mandela for what he calls a much needed transformation of the judicial system, among others. I can imagine that George, being in some ways a typical South African, would want to debate the issue of the status of these dreams. In fact, I'm reminded of what South African activist Steve Biko once said, explaining the, the tendency uh, that South Africans have for debate. He says, Westerners have on many occasions been surprised at the capacity we have for talking to each other not for the sake of arriving at a particular conclusion, but merely to enjoy the communication for its own sake. George and I could debate the fact that millions of poor South Africans have houses that are not tin shacks for the first time, who also have for the first time water and electricity. We could debate whether that's good enough. We can debate the reality versus the promise on this and other baseline issues against which the new democracy compares with the old. And I know we would argue vehemently about crime. Is it worse or is it better? Or is it like many things affected by the fact that the society now is more transparent and knows more about what used to be kept a secret? There are many things we could debate as South Africans do every day thanks to a press that is still adjusting to its role in the new South Africa, but is nonetheless freed of its shackles, if not criticisms of government. Knowing Dr. Death, our debate would be over a bottle of the robust red wine he loved so well. And knowing me, I would take him on, now knowing a little bit about red wine in South Africa. <laughs> But I know enough now also to know where to find my best ammunition in other matters. And so I would go to my arsenal and I would remove one of the books containing one of the strong emerging voices of the new South Africa to help me make my case. Voices like Beverly Jansen's, a former municipal counselor, mayor, and school teacher in the Western Cape. She writes, 
Let us place lighted candles in sparkling crystal jars and clay calabashes to celebrate the beginning of a new dawn in our existence. Let us send a celestial light from our majestic mountains and blood-spattered sands where spears once pierced freedom-craving hearts to envelop the horror of yesterday. Let us write words of hope for those whose dreams before were stillborn, paint pictures of love for those shackled by the sorrow of dark nights gone, dance duets with, outstretched, with arms outstretched in flowing white robes, and sing praises in virginal voices while celebrating the beginning of a new dawn in our existence. Le miracle de la fruit du sud, indeed. Alive, definitely. Well, as well as could be expected. A matter of debate, to be sure, but well enough to engage the debate. It is a Kennedy School tradition that we follow lectures and presentations such as the one that Charlene has given with questions for a few minutes. There are microphones here and here, up there and there. I ask you if you would identify yourself uh, and uh, we will proceed. Yes. Hi, good afternoon. Terrence Gilchrist, first year master public policy student at the Kennedy School. Um, over the weekend, Ali Missouri spoke at MIT and he talked about regional integration as a way to transform what's happening on the continent. Even though South Africa has this HIV epidemic, even though it's having negative population um, growth, it does have a well-developed infrastructure. Do you see it playing a role in the transformation of the continent in terms of regional integration? We're gonna talk about that a little bit one of these nights, I forget which, I think tomorrow night actually, but I'll, I'll, I'll give that a little bit of a, a crack because I don't quite describe it in, in that way. I, I do agree that, um, that, that, that that is one of the ways to go. I mean, South Africa is, is sort of like the United States of, of the African continent. And for all of the criticism that one can make of Mbeki on the AIDS policies, he has been a visionary and a leader in trying to organize both the regional, well, not organize, they were already organized, but to re-infuse them in a new direction. And so you've got in Southern Africa, SADC, uh, they haven't had a whole lot of success with Zimbabwe, at least insofar as we know, because once upon a time, Kofi Annan told me that negotiations go on above water and below water, and I'd like to think that there's a lot going on below water because there's nothing going on above water on that issue right now. But, but you know, the, these, these are the organizations that, that speak to the specific uh, issues within that area. And, and I think that a newly infused uh, SADAC or in, in West Africa, what is it, ECOWAS, and all around the continent, they're, they're all coalescing now around this idea of, of NEPAD, and again, that's something I'm going to talk about tomorrow, but there are new instruments uh, on the continent which seem to be uh, getting people's attention. Now, the extent to which they would be successful in getting people to adhere to things like good governance and good economic management, et cetera, et cetera, remains to be seen. But there is, to go back to my theme, new news on the continent, and I think that's part of it. Uh, how are you? Um, Omar Abdul Malik. I'm a graduate of the uh, Kennedy School, and I'm here this year researching and uh, writing a book on Islam in the United States. A book um, on what? Islam in oh, the United okay. States, yes. That would um, be interesting. Thank you. <laughs> uh, having grown up in the American South and having lived in South Africa and seen, uh, having observed the uh, difference in the socioeconomic status of, of blacks in both areas and having some um, 
knowledge of the cause for that. Do you see um, or do you think it's possible for these situations, especially the one in, speaking of South Africa now, to equalize itself without massive um, infusion of capital um, from the government and, uh, and some hardship on the part of those who have profited from apartheid in the past. Also, do you see any relationship between, between that and the reparations movement that mm -hmm. Professor Charles Ogletree is head, uh, spearheading here in the United States? Who put this plant in the audience? <laughs> This man wants to get me fired. I'm, I'm, I'm your friend. I'm your friend. <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, that's, that's an interesting thing you posit because I suspect you posit it as, a, as something to be thought about as opposed to having me actually answer it. Uh, because, uh, <laughs> because that is one of the big, big debates. And, and, you know, what you have in South Africa, for example, now is a government that well, I started to say you sound like one of the ultras because in South Africa right now there's this big tension between, well, the government is left, but the government is, has, has moved so close to the center that it is now criticizing what they call the ultras who are more left than they were. So that there's this big debate, and Santi Terreblanche, the e economist that I quoted, has been um, put into the doghouse by the government because he is a member of the, um, I think he's in the ANC, or he certainly was in the apartheid struggle, and he's now criticizing the government for not doing enough. And I think that's the classic uh, problem that you always have um, in societies where you have these tremendous despair, economic uh, disparities. Who is it that you, you, you turn to, to, to to uplift the masses? And do you rely on government exclusively? As, and, and can you, in fact, rely on a government that is, is itself right on the edge, um, where is it going to get its resources? Or do you try to generate um, uh, uh, activity within the, within the private sector to, to take up some of the slack the government can't provide? I mean, that, that's the classic, isn't that the classic thing that always happens? And so that's what you're having played out in South Africa now. And, and I think you do have to look at, I mean, this is not a, an answer you can come to today because you do have to look at the amazing amount of work this government has done on behalf of black people since 1994 compared with what has what ha now you know the apartheid regime started in the last few days of apartheid to build a few schools and stuff but you walk into those schools and just want to throw up you know they were just done for show and there's nothing in them so they did, you know, hustle up a few things to try to say to the international community that we don't look as bad as you said we did, but they didn't. And this government has done a tremendous amount. But now the rubber is about to hit the road because you still have vast disparities between the rich and the poor. And the president's always talking about this. And the minute he starts to talk about two societies, the white people jump up and down and scream and start calling them a racist. So he's damned if he does, he's damned if he doesn't. But that's the, that's the balance that they have to work at. And as I said in, 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 in earlier about this whole issue of reparations and, and, and whether you put a wealth tax on the government, this is something they're going to have to work out. I'm, I'm not the person who's, who thankfully, has to, has to resolve that. But you can see what those tensions are, because there are people who believe that if you benefited under apartheid, then you need to pay. But, there, but, but it's, a delicate, it's a delicate thing, because, I mean, look at Saudi Arabia today, and I don't want to get into this, but I'm going to get into it for a minute. Um, what is going to be the debate in Saudi Arabia now among businesses, Western, Western businesses? Do we stay or do we go? You know, and it's a very real question. And if we stay, can we, we protect our people? And South Africa is worried about how it holds, it doesn't at this point even have enough, it, it, its growth has been a, a, a pretty good, it, you know, compared with other uh, African countries. But it's not sufficient to make a real big difference in the economic problems that it has. So. So it has to be very careful how it approaches the people who right now still uh, uh, hold the reins of, of power in the, in, the, in the country, really, in the economic sector. They cannot do things to piss them off. 
Otherwise, they're going to pay a huge price, and it's going to take a hell of a lot longer. So you ask a person who, who is poor and doesn't have anything, you know, what would you like me to do at this point? Do you want me to do something that's going to piss these businesses off so bad that it's going to take you twice as long to, to get redressed? Or should we be careful about it in the hope that we retain them and attract others? So that's, that's the sort of equation that they're, that they're working with. So I can't answer your question, but I can say that those are the, those are the dynamics. And I don't think it's simple. I honestly don't think it's simple. It's, it, you know, it, it's like the reparations thing here. It's not that simple. But there, at least, it's closer to the edge of, of, of the event. So, so it could, it, you know, whatever happens there might be a whole, a whole lot easier to resolve. The government's not going to not accept the money if it comes there, but the president said they're not going to respect the judgments of foreign court. So, you know, it's 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 a tough it's a tough situation. But government, no government anywhere in the world can solve all the problems of poor people. Okay. You got to have a business sector, and in South Africa, you know, people are saying. Uh, oh, they're creating a bunch of rich black people now, and that's as bad as, you know, having a bunch of rich white people who don't do anything for the black people. But you cannot attract capital unless you have people who can buy things. You, you got to have a consumer class. So that's what makes South Africa right now so exciting because it's like a real laboratory. It, its constitution is it drew from the best liberal constitutions in the world. So the constitution is fabulous. So, so that part of the laboratory experiment, it, you know, gets probably an A plus. Now this next phase is in the execution of things that are guaranteed in the constitution. How do you do it? I mean, how, how do you do it in a new society and, and, and keep everybody happy? Keep everybody, you know, it's a tension. But that's what makes it exciting for me as a journalist. Maybe not if I was a poor person, you know, waiting for relief. But you know, it's um, it's part of this laboratory, and it's it's very interesting. Thank you. What, one more question, quick. Uh, well, my uh, my name is Jesse Tampio. I'm a law student. I'm making my first trip to South Africa this summer, and I guess I had the question that you started to address there by talking about the Constitution and just the development of a rights culture there because the Constitution, as you say, was extremely progressive and promising a lot of social and economic rights to housing, to property, I mean, to uh, uh, education and uh, health care. And there's a fear that they, you know, might have promised too much and that that might heighten expectations and the slowness of the implementation. You know, there's a lot of really amazing um, cases that have hit the Constitutional Court but a lot of people are saying, well, now what? What do we do with this amazing judgment if there's not an effective way to you know, disseminate the principle and to, to implement the rights? Mm -hmm. And do you think that, you know, that this has been successful, that you see the development of a real kind of rights consciousness? Um, or do you think that it might lead to some stagnation you know, and just p people kind of wondering when they're going to really see this stuff uh, you know, at their doorstep? God, I wish I could answer that. No, I, I could, I, from my civil rights side, I, I would say this. Um, you never let up until victory is won. You know, you keep on pressing, you keep on, and there is beginning to develop a greater uh, civil society. As I said earlier, you, you know, the civil society organizations took a huge hit at the end of apartheid, because they're all invested in the ending apartheid. And so were the funders here in America and in Europe and, you know, all over the world. Um, and so they're having to rebuild uh, civil society now. And as I said, the AIDS groups are among the most uh, active and the most vocal. Uh, and, and so as they emerge, they will choose the issues, like when the anti-war the anti march was fascinating to watch. Because, you know, three quarters of the people out there didn't give anything about the war. They were the landless people's movement, <laughs> they were the AIDS activists, they were the this and that and the other, but they were all, you know, marching, but when they got up to speak, you know, a few of them talked about against the war because South Africa is like 99.9% .9 against this thing. But most of them got up and talked about their issues, which is very interesting because 
you know, so that's the civil rights answer. You know, they got to keep pushing, they got to build their, their thing. Now, the other answer I would give from the journalist analyst side, this democracy is 10 years old. That's younger than a baby, a child 10 years old in a, in a real sense. I mean, in Becky, I, I called it adolescent democracy, and then I heard the president describe it as an infant democracy, so I said, oh, I could go there, you know, <laughs> um, because it is, which is to say the civil rights side of me says, well, okay, but you still got to hold them accountable. But then the other side of me says, you know, where was America 10 years into its democracy? Now, it's an unfair comparison because the world is different. I mean, you've got all kinds of, well, I don't have to tell you what's different about it. They, they don't have the luxury of doing this when, when, when nobody's watching because everybody's watching and everybody's making demands, you know. But, you know, fortunately, I get to stand just a little bit above the fray and every now and then remind people when those people came back from exile to take over the country, F.W. de Klerk, who I understand was here, I interviewed him just before Mandela was sworn in. And he said, I'll be back in five years' time. He said, because they're going to screw it up. He said, they're a liberation movement. They don't know anything about running the country. And I'll be back in power in five years. Well, the only time I have seen Mandela absolutely blow his stack was when I put that question, that answer to him. I said, well, you know, President the Clerk said, and Mandela went ballistic. <laughs> I won't go into all the details of what he said, but the point is that, <laughs> point is that um, the, the farther away from that I get, even though the Clerk was wrong in his conclusion, he wasn't wrong in his analysis. You had a liberation movement coming into a into an industrialized society. They'd been in the bush. I mean, some of them, like in Becky, had been running around capitals and stuff, so they were very sophisticated and stuff. But everybody said that the government was going to be a mile wide and an inch deep, the, the, those who would be. And, and it, that's essentially what, what they've had to work on. So it might be now two miles wide and three inches deep or four inches deep but it's building something out of nothing because who do you trust from the old regime? You got to figure that out. I mean, four years in, th three or four years into to, to this new dispensation, I was interviewing him, Becky, and he said, you know, we're trying to run a country that we don't know. We don't know where the bodies are buried. Somebody told me the other day, and I can't tell that, that's off the record. <laughs> but, they, they have had to figure out, it, it wasn't as bad as some countries like Zambia and some of these other countries where when the departing colonialists left, they burned every piece of paper and every, you know, there were no records, but it was close. The difference is in the industry, you know, in the level of industrialization of the society and, and you do have this layer of, of civil servants who've been there forever and they do you know, punch the clock and make things work. But that's what's interesting about this process of training. You just can't put somebody black in there and say, do this, because they don't know the combination to the safe. They got to figure that out. Either they got to tell them, which they didn't do at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. They didn't tell them. So either they got to tell them or they got to figure out how do we undo this safe now and they can't blow it up because it's a democratic society. And to get to the bottom, I'm sorry, it takes so long, but to get to the bottom line of your question, there is a democratic human rights culture there in place and it's growing every day. I mean, you do not have the kinds of things that I described happening. Winnie Mandela got sentenced the other day to prison. I don't think he's gonna serve any time, but she got sentenced. And, and very few people criticize that even though a white judge did the sentencing the speech he gave at the at the at the sentencing was just amazing i sat there with my mouth open because he 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 honored her for the work that she had done in building this country but he said you have contributed to the building of this country and to this democratic culture 
which is now going to hold you accountable. You helped to create this, and now you, you will abide by it. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. And so I'm optimistic because people are not going to give up this thing that they have now been building for 10 years. They're just going to make it bigger and bigger. It's just that they still need support. It's, it's, it's like in my lecture tomorrow, I'll talk about the baby steps to democracy. It's, it's, it's baby steps, but it's going there. I think it's going there. Charlene's other two lectures are not going to be here. They are going to be tomorrow and the next day at 4 o'clock in the Center for European Studies, Adolphus Bush Hall, the lower level conference room. That's at 27 Kirkland Street. If you would, please join me in one more round of applause.